Some of you were lip singing while they were singing. We give you a chance to join them. Let's stand and sing it together, please. this but they're going to sing it again while you have opportunity to welcome and greet those around you please remain standing we will continue the emphasis of the service by singing together mine eyes have seen the glory you and you may be seated. As always, my privilege to welcome you and to thank you for being here on this, what we would call Memorial Day weekend and huh? Bethany's Day. Bethany's Day. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? I'm glad you do because I don't. So anyway, we're glad you're here to be a part with us in this. And we have those who visit and we welcome you. 
<coughs> and we thank you for being here. By way of announcement, let me remind you of several on the agenda that are coming up this coming week. On Wednesday night, of course, on Tuesday night, the ladies are meeting for their monthly meeting. On Wednesday night, we will be together for prayer and for the Bible and for the rehearsal. Is that on Wednesday night this week? Yeah, okay. They, they shuffle things around on me and I don't always stay with it. You'll want to remember this, that uh, this, immediately following this service, those who are available and would be interested in doing so, how many boxes do you have to pack? Uh, I should have some for at least 100 boxes, hopefully more. There are 100 empty shoe boxes back there and items to fill all of them that are already there and they will welcome you to share with them in that. And the pay for doing so is lunch? Lunch. Lunch, right. And for those, the young people who maybe want, wondering if you should help out with that or not, I believe the menu is pizza, is that right? That's correct. That's correct. I'm glad to know we're all on the same house, Bill. That's after immediately following the service this morning. Keep in mind also that next Sunday is our annual harvest dinner when we come together as church family to share together and you'll not want to miss that. We'll start about 5.30 at 5.30 p.m. And then there's also the opportunity for some of you that have coats that maybe have shrunk and you're not, on, not on able to wear them anymore we have somewhere that can use them, and if they're clean and in good shape, then you're invited to bring them, and we will share them with those of need. This is the most important announcement you're going to hear me make in a little while. Next Sunday, next Sunday, after the close of this service, at the close of this service, there will be a brief business session which we do not usually have on Sunday. It will take hopefully two or three minutes. But the bylaws say that we have to approve, that we need to approve the pastor selection committee. They've been contacted, they've agreed to serve, and you are to vote on that. That's next Sunday as soon as the service is over. <coughs> Hillary, <laughs> come on in the door so I won't have to have everyone turning around looking. Do you have them in that bu bu bucket? <laughs> the twins, where, where's the little one? He's in the back with Kara. Oh, okay, he's back there. And who do you have with you, please? I have Brayden and Ryan and Channing and Crew. How many you have, four? Four. <laughs> Sorry, not late. They, how, <laughs> How old are they now, Hillary? Nine weeks. Nine weeks. Yes, sir. We're delighted to have them here for the very first time. Welcome them to Cobb Park Baptist Church. <laughs> Will they be show and tell at the end of the service today? <laughs> All right. That's later. <laughs> okay. What, uh, the suggestion up here is that we simply pass them around during the service. Is that okay? <laughs> All right. We're glad they're here. We're glad they're here. In addition to these announcements, we take the opportunity to rejoice with those who have special reason to rejoice which means birthdays over here, anywhere during the past month or coming up. There are none over here. Yeah, oh, we got a whole handful. Gary, did you have yours up first? Wow, I had a birthday yesterday, 88. 88, Mary Ellen is. <laughs> oh, okay. Madison had one Tuesday. How many, Madison? 
19. All right. Jane? Was he somewhere between 19 and 88? Yes. He's somewhere in between there. All right. And I keep seeing hands say, Ronnie Hall. How many? 17. 17. Wonderful. Did I miss any downstairs? Now? Betty Laura. I don't want to overlook Betty Laura because <laughs> uh, how many Miss Laura? Younger than me. You're younger than me. That's a <laughs> Do, huh? Mr. Bo has one this week. Mr. Bo? Uh, King has one this week, Bo. How many? 52. 52? Good. Any others? Any others? <laughs> Terry, you have one or are you just leaning on the door back there? <laughs> Any anniversaries anywhere? Let's go, Tara, before somebody comes up with one. He's really not visiting with us because he's a member of this church. But Jacob Newsom is back with us. You remember the last Sunday he was here, what, this spring? Uh, we had a special prayer for David because he, Jacob, not David, you know, he's still here. For Jacob who spent his time in Louisiana on the uh, fish boats. And he's been there ever since and that season ended just a week or so ago, Jacob. And you're back home now. Stand up, Jacob. Let, let him see how nice you look there. <laughs> I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but it is reported by me, to me by a reliable source that Jacob would like to take that course where they fly the airplane and locate the fish. Right, Jacob? And that's a possibility. That would be good. We come to our prayer time aware of the fact that um, we have had um, family connected losses this past week. It's full of packet e Ever since we've been going to Farnham Manor, we visited with Fuller Packet, who was a patient there. Fuller died this past Friday, Thursday. I have not gotten information on service. At 10 o'clock at Montrose or is it? Montrose. Welch's. Saturday. Welch's in Montrose on Friday. Visitation 6 to 8 Friday, Saturday at 10 o'clock at Welch's in Montrose. And then there is the announcement, and Donna, can you straighten me out on this one with the David Parr? I mean, David's okay, but. Karen, Sharon. Yes, um, John Will Parr's grandson, his, um, Gloria Hayes, Gloria's oldest son, Michael, um, passed away in his sleep. He was 38. 38 years old. So keep John Will and his family in your prayers. John Will and the family in your prayers. And there are others of need as well. We need to remember our country today. Amen. Amen. On this special Veterans Day weekend. Let us join together as we pray. Father, it's good to be here today and we count it a privilege to be able to be here to share in this service. Thank you for those who have the interest and concern and the desire to worship on Sunday as those days come around. Bless us in our time together and bless those families that have experienced a loss of loved ones these recent days. We pray for them. We pray your goodness and grace in a special way. Pray for our country, Lord. It seems that the news uh, expressions every day 
bring signs of problems here and there and elsewhere. And help us to realize there's really only one answer for America's problems, and that's you. And I pray that in these days, we will come to an awareness in a special way of our need for you. Bless those who have special needs connected here today and will ever be grateful and praise you and love you for it. So we commit the day to you, Lord, and thank you for it. <clears throat> praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. As uh, we've been reminded, this is uh, Veterans Day weekend. You going to tell them, are they, you want them to stand, stand on? when they're... When your service, uh, service group is mentioned in the song, you're supposed to stand. And then I guess you can be seated and then we'll get to you at the end. This is a song this crowd loves to sing. And those of us who can't sing just love to hear it. So they're going to do it again this morning. <clears throat>
men and women. And while you're still standing, or while you, you will remain standing, and we will sing together the grand old hymn, America the Beautiful. Based on what I saw a minute ago, all four of our uh, offering bearers are uh, uh, veterans this morning. Mitch, what were you in? Uh, Fort Knox. <laughs> Fort, Fort Knox. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, Mike, go ahead and pray for us for a bit. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for each and every one that's here today. We special thanks for the veterans that are here with us today. We ask a special blessing upon the men and women of the military that they provide us our freedoms, that we can be here with you. We ask that you bless the gift and the giver and multiply these offerings in your service. Amen. Amen.
thank you, and you may be seated. If you are a regular attender here at Cobb Park, and most of you are, you're aware that the choir does everything possible to make the music fit in with the entirety of the service, which they've already done thus far, and they want to do one other time as they sing for us at this time a patriotic medley. <coughs> into preparing for us every Sunday like this. And there is another credit line that should be inserted. We sit here and we see these pictures flash up there like this morning and everything seemed to be right on target. The thing is, they do not come through in a package like that. But every week, Angie Sanders sits down with the music that's going to be sung that Sunday and somehow she finds the pictures to tie in with the music. Now she's back there looking at 
one of the kids, I don't know, how many of y'all have now? Eight or ten? How many you have all together? But she's back there looking after some of them, but we appreciate what all of these people are doing. I'm reading this morning from the fifth chapter of the book of Isaiah. And it reads as follows, the first seven verses. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between my and my, me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Well, then, when I expected it to bring forth good groups, grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? Now, please tell me, you want what I will do to my vineyard? I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold oppression, for righteousness, but behold a cry for help. You are aware that God speaks to his people in various and different ways. In the case of Elijah, God tried to speak to him through the thunderstorm, but not there. And then through the howling winds, but not there. And then through the lightning, and not there. And then the Bible says that God spoke to him in a still, small voice and conveyed to him the message that he wanted him to have. As we pause here this morning, I read a passage of scripture to you from the fifth chapter of the book of Isaiah, a scripture passage that has to deal with what went on in God's people many, many years ago, and in a very dramatic way, by way of analogy and story, the prophet conveys the message that he wanted his people to have. Now, I sat down to prepare what I would call this morning a Veterans Day message, fully aware that yesterday was Veterans Day. And then last Sunday, the news came of the church in Texas that was gathered for worship just like we are this morning. And during the time of that worship service, a, man may, a madman appeared on the scene, and I think the count was 27 or 28 people were killed, and a bunch of others were wounded in the process. And I thought to myself, is there a way that I can pay tribute to the veterans? And I think we've tried to do that through the music and the other things, the emphases of the day. But is there a way in which we need to try to convey a message to America as well? And I think there is. And I would like to use this passage from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah to try to interpret for you and to point out to you what that message might be. The prophet says that God appeared to this man by way of a vision and showed him this beautiful vineyard that uh, he should purchase and make the best of, that it would provide delicious fruit for the people of the land. And he did so. And then after all of the things that he went through, there came the harvest time. And when the harvesters went out to harvest the grapes from the vineyard, they were no good. The Bible says they were wild grapes, sour grapes. 
They weren't even sufficient enough to make red rose wine for 7-Eleven. You say, how you know about that? Well, I know a lot of things that you, but anyway, they were insufficient for that. And so he had to tear down his vineyard, tore it up completely. He'd built a fence around it, put a wine press there and all of that, tear it down. It's no good. This hill will never support a sufficient and adequate uh, fruit for God's people. And that's the parable as it's written here in the fifth chapter of the book of Isaiah. Now let me walk you back through it with a little more detail and you'll see sort of where we may be coming from. God speaks to his servant Isaiah and gives him a vision. And through that vision he spoke to him. This man was shown a beautiful, beautiful hillside. And God told him that he was to buy that hillside. And he was to use it as a place for planting a vineyard. And so the man bought the land. And then he cleaned the land of the brush and the debris and everything that was there. There were rocks on it and he hauled away the rocks and the stones. And then he tilled the soil, and that was another demanding experience, given the fact that all of these stones and rocks were there. But then he saw that the land was in such a beautiful position at the crown of a hill, which means he would always have an adequate runoff of the water. And so God told him to build a fence around that vineyard, and in his vision he built a fence around the vineyard. And he found that he had stones left over from the fence so that he was able to build a wine press in the vineyard. In other words, the grapes would not have to be transported to some other place to be processed for the making of wine. And so he did that. And then he sat back and waited for the harvest season. But when the harvest season came, he was disappointed indeed. For you see, the grapes from that vineyard were of no value whatsoever. They were sour grapes. They, were, they could not be used for the making of wine or anything else. And so God said to his servant, I want you to do away with this vineyard. I want you to get rid of it. He had to pull up all the vines and burn or destroy them in some other way. He tore down the stone wall around his vineyard. He destroyed the wine press that was there. Never again, never again would there be grapes or vines growing on the top of that vineyard. It was done with. It was rejected. It was no good. He asked the question, what more could I do that I have not already done? And the answer came back that there was nothing more that he could do. And then there came the punchline from God when he reminded his servant, Israel is that vineyard. They are the ones who I blessed with so much of heaven's blessings. I did so much for your people. I provided for them. When you were in bondage in Egypt, I led you out after 400 years of captivity. When you came up across the obstacle of the Red Sea, I opened the waters for you. When you passed through the devastation of the desert, then I was there with you to provide water in the midst of the devastation. When you had no food, I provided food for you. Then when you came to the promised land and the spies went out to check it out, I sent them out and two of them came back with a message that we should press on. And against the majority vote, you pressed on. And you possessed the land in due time. And the land was blessed. And my people went against enemies that were much larger and more advanced than were you, but you defeated them. And in the process of all of this, there were years of prosperity and goodness. 
But in due time, the worst of all followed. Because you see, Israel became that fruitless vine that had, op that had opportunities beyond imagine. And they rejected those opportunities and they let God down and in essence turned their back against him rather than doing what God wanted them to do. And so the question was raised, what more could have been done? As far as the prophet was concerned, what was the message of this for, was the message of this for Israel? And the message of this was is for Israel was that they would have to be rejected by God, and they were rejected and taken into captivity for all of those years in a foreign land. Their cities were destroyed. Their armies were um, defeated. They were a people overcome when they had overcome so many obstacles and challenges in the past. They became a people of greed. They had so much, but yet were not satisfied with what they had. They were a people of drunkenness, a people of moral and spiritual blindness. They became a people of sin and depravity of every imagine and sort. The list of what they had done was a message that God was trying to get across to his people that they had failed God as his vineyard. There were miracles going on happening, but yet that didn't seem to faze them. And so God's embarrassing question to these people was a simple one. What more could I have done for you? What more could I have done for you? And the answer came back that there was nothing more that God could do but that judgment would come upon his people. And that judgment came upon his people. And as already indicated, his people were taken into captivity. Their nation was taken away from them. And they faced the offending hand of God. Now that's the introduction to the sermon that I want to preach. And the sermon itself is very brief. Because you see, the message of Isaiah's vision here in chapter 5 of his uh, prophecy should be as clear as it could possibly be. Because the message that comes through to me this morning, that what I have read to you about ancient Israel could be said about America today. This very morning, Everything that I've said about Israel could be said about our country, the one in which we live. We, have been a, we are a country of untold blessings as far as God is concerned. A people that came from a foreign land because we were seeking, our forefathers were seeking a place where they could worship freely. We came here, God blessed in manifold ways, one after another, after another, after another. We said that we were a nation under God, and we put it on our coins, and we put it into the official records of our country. And one after one, we've seen the response to it. We stamped in God we trust on our, on our frequency. But our response has not met the challenge that has been laid out before us. There are immigrants here today in this country who came from other places of less opportunity. And ever so often we read in the paper, here's a guy who came here from one of the islands and became the most valuable player in the, in the entire football league this past season or a football player who accomplished this, or a man from here, there, or anywhere that made it to the very top in government or in business, a multimillionaire, a billionaire, or whatever. And often the punchline is given. Only in America could it have happened. 
And they're exactly right. Only in America could some of the things that we've seen happen take place. And yet, in spite of this, in spite of the blessings of God upon our people, we have become a people that by and large have rejected him. We have become a people, become a people where we have forgotten about what God has done for us. In the passage that I read to you a while ago, it talks about America's, it talks about the wild grapes of Isaiah's prophet. And that's what's happened to us. A nation this morning of greed and drunkenness and moral blindness. A nation of broken homes and broken vows and broken hearts. A nation that turned its back on God and produced other gods. A nation of free love and safe sex and premarital affairs. A nation of where we have pot smokers and pill poppers and needle jabbers. A nation of violence and crime and blood sharing in many ways. A nation that has gone to the bottom of the pits in some of the things that are shown on national television or in the theaters of America today. And here we stand on another Veterans Day, thanking God for his blessings of the past, but deep down in our hearts, wondering, 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 how long, oh God, how long? Another reference from scripture itself. How long will God let us go down this road that we are currently on as far as a country and a co as far as a nation is concerned? And so our choices, I believe, are very few. And our choice is to turn to God and go his way or take the way of ancient Israel and end up as the fruitless vineyard on the ash heap of has been. Let me conclude my message this morning with a brief example of what I'm talking about. Imagine in your mind a beautiful hill in Israel today. Imagine the green grass or the flowers that bloom or the trees that are there. And imagine that hillside being planted with a wonderful, wonderful vineyard that has all of the prospects of being a very, very productive vineyard. And then I want you to see what has happened to it. A sad picture indeed of Israel's fruitless vines. Now I want to show you a second picture. There's no difference in it. And it's even sadder than the first one because it's a picture of America's fruitless vines. I realize in saying what I'm sharing with you this morning that I'm really preaching to the choir because I'm talking to people who love their country and love their Lord and their families and all of that. But somehow or another, we cannot, we must not hide our lights under the bushel and continue in such a haphazard way in what we may be trying to do for the Lord. I believe that God has us on the clock this morning and the clock is ticking. And will we decide in our heart of hearts, will we decide that however small or insignificant we may be, we will do our part, individually, family-wise, church-wise, however, that we will do our part to make sure that this vineyard called America becomes productive and worthy of God's blessings in the days to come. I stand here this morning and look at the nine-week-old twins Wondering in my heart of hearts, what will they be dealing with when they get to the age of some of us in this room this morning? 
and it should shake us to the core to realize this is no time for fiddling when Rome is burning. Let's pray. Father, we recognize on occasions such as this that we have needs as a country. We are, as ancient Israel, blessed beyond our deserving in so many ways. And yet we let you down in so many ways. And so I pray this morning, on this Veterans Day weekend, we'll realize the sacrifices that others have made for their country. Now we, may we be willing to make sacrifices for you and for your kingdom and for kingdom causes. And we'll be grateful and we'll praise you and we'll love you for it. For we make our prayer in the name of Jesus, as always, with thanksgiving. Amen. To conclude our service, it's not an invitational hymn as such, but we can make it that by simply saying if it's a time when God speaks to a heart about any need, if it is to become a part of the church officially or a recommitment or whatever it may be, it begins, we talk about our country, but it begins with the individual. My country tis of thee. But we're going to get to the last verse before we get through with this song. And when we get there, I want you to notice what the words say. Let's stand. Let's sing it together, please. Catherine. <laughs> Margaret, come on while I'm talking. This is Catherine Jones. Now, uh, I guess Catherine has been here for numerous things from time to time, but we got to know a little better when we started going to uh, Farnham Manor, where she and her husband are both at this time. She's a friend of Margaret. Long time. Long time <laughs> friend. Long time. Over where you, buddy. How long, you say? Oh, we don't do that. You don't do that. <laughs> But Catherine came to me recently and said, uh, can I join the Baptist church? Amen. Now, wait a minute. She said, I attend, I'm really a member of Methodist church now. But Wayne and Jean, she says, I belong to Cool Springs Baptist church at one time, where the Carters were at one time. But she said, I'd like to become a member of Carbon Park, if I may. 
And if you say, Catherine, you may, say amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You may. <laughs> Margaret, will you stand here with her? I oh, mean, yeah, of course I will. Always uh, have. You always have. Always have. That's good. That's good. Thank you for being here. Uh, what are y'all going to do with those babies now so everybody can see them? <laughs> you'll make out, okay. I'm sure you'll make out. Okay. Uh, Catherine, y'all just stand right here in the middle. Will you do that? Yes. Catherine and Margaret. Margaret. <laughs> are you talking to someone? I thought you got them before you got here, Andrew. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll have our closing prayer. John Penny, will you dismiss us this morning with words of blessing? Almighty God.